A passion for computing put these men behind bars. I'm taking over a TV network. The real story of some high-tech hooligans. Some companies are starting to offer internet access for free, but is it worth the price? Classic board games jump from the living room floor to your computer. Find out what gets lost in the translation. Plus, internet giant Netscape gives us a brand new way to enjoy the web, while Desmond shows us the newest and smallest way to compute on the road. Sophie will be here to tell us what a mirror site is, and a CNET's Best of the Web takes us on a tour of some great art retrospectives, right now on CNET Central. Now, from the number one on-air and online information source for the digital age, this is CNET Central. Hi, I'm Richard Hart. And I'm Gina St. John. Welcome to CNET Central. Hackers, it's a term often given to computer fiends who use sophisticated knowledge of technology to crack security codes. For some, it starts out as a thrill, accessing files that were meant for other users, manipulating security systems that were thought to be watertight. But all this intoxicating power tempts some hackers into illicit activity, and often their shenanigans land them behind bars or worse. Take Kevin Polson. He was caught breaking into phone company systems. He did his time, but the judge handed him an additional more sweeping sentence, a ban from using computers at all. In this day and age of massive computer automation, does that punishment fit the crime? Hackers penetrate and ravage private and publicly owned computer systems. Hackers are the, uh, are, are the, the bad guys lurking in the shadows, sort of embodying the whole fear of, uh, of new technology. I'm taking over a TV network. Now there are thousands, probably. You know, everybody wants to be a hacker, it seems like. With hackers being glorified in the movies and the computer underground, a lot of younger computer users are being swayed by the legendary exploits of people like Kevin Paulson and Chris Lamprey. The problem is many of this new breed of hackers aren't aware that their pranks could be criminal in the eyes of the law. Chris Lamprecht, a.k.a. Minor Threat, won't get out of prison till the year 2000, his sentence for hacking-related crimes. Even then, he won't be allowed to use a computer for three more years, in addition to his sentence he feels is unjust. The guy who's in here for wire fraud, when he gets out, are they going to say he can't use the telephone? Or anybody with mail fraud can't use the mail? I think it's like that. Notorious hacker Kevin Polson began scamming free phone calls and used this knowledge to win a radio contest. Well, I won the contests by breaking into phone company computers and then using those computers to take over the phone lines leading to the radio stations. Then that way I could make sure I was the right numbered caller. As a computer crime, it would have carried about a year. By charging it as money laundering because I deposited the check in the bank, uh, that made it a minimum of three years. At the time that they started their investigation, I was um, just a phone hacker, basically. I was breaking into phone company computers and phone company buildings, uh, but it was all done just to learn more about the phone system. There was no profit motive, and I didn't cause anybody any damage. But then the FBI got involved, and they started charging me with national security charges. They, they talked about it from day one, um, trying to make it into an espionage case. Um, I got angry, and I, I said, well, you know, if that's how you want to play it, uh, you'll have to catch me first. They have this desire to live on what they call the dark side. It's, it's more of a challenge to them. Detective Randy Bradley at the high-tech unit of the Austin, Texas police believes restricting computer use by hackers after they've completed their prison sentences is just. It's an effort to rehabilitate the person to get them to lead a productive role in society more than, than as a punishment. I'm barred from legal use of computers, um, but the restrictions would, would do nothing to deter somebody from illegal use of them. Um, it just keeps me from getting a, a good job, paying, uh, paying off the restitution to the radio stations, things like that. I see almost seem designed to thwart um, my own rehabilitation. For more on the book about Kevin Polson's life of crime and an excerpt from The Watchman, come to our website at CNET.com. We'll link you to a site with all the information. Enjoying the World Wide Web usually means paying an Internet service provider a flat fee. Consumers shell out anywhere from $5 to $40 a month to stay connected. But lately, some ISPs have been pitching thrifty web surfers the ultimate bargain, 
online access for free. Sound too good to be true? Well, we sent reporter Hari Srinivasan to find out. When Fran Thorson isn't gardening compulsively, her latest interest is surfing the web. The best part about it, she isn't paying a dime. And I figured if it wasn't what I wanted or if it was less than what I wanted, then I could always go to something that uh, would cost me a little bit of money. Her internet service provider, CyberFreeway.net, is one of a new breed of companies giving access away for absolutely nothing. The only catch, viewers have to share the screen with a scrolling advertisement. And for users like Fran, that's no bother. Sometimes you have to sit and wait for uh, transfers to occur. So it, it kind of breaks the monotony. Aside from the advertisement, her connection is as good as any other. I've talked to people, like I say, online, and I don't see that they're getting any more than I am. Mrs. Fran Thorson seems to have an amazing deal to get online for free. Now, experts that study the Internet service world will tell you a couple of things. One, if a deal sounds too good to be true, it probably is. They'll also tell you that the lowest priced Internet access doesn't come without trade-offs. If somebody really is driven towards, uh, towards uh, getting the lowest rates possible for their internet service, they're likely to get a very low quality of service along with that. That's because customer service is usually one of the first places cheaper ISPs can cut corners. The next major expense is the number of servers an internet provider has, something major players like America Online are reinvesting in. Some ISPs offer lifetime access for one easy payment, but companies like J3 Communication and U.S. Freeway found it didn't pay to give away the farm. And truthfully, at the end of the day, everybody's got to pay their way. There's, uh, there's no free lunch, as some, you know, some famous economist once, once said. So what will the Internet service landscape of the future look like? I think you'll see the Internet services market start to look a lot like the long-distance market. Until then, Mrs. Fran Thorson will be riding the info highway toll free. Hari is here with us now to answer a couple of questions. Now, Hari, how do I know that these ISPs are legit and they're not some fly-by-night operation like the ones that folded? It really gets back to gauging a good deal. When you see the ad in the paper and you call the folks up to see what types of prices they're offering, be a smart consumer. Ask them some questions. Ask them how they plan on making money. Get them to send you a press release or other documentation along with their software to give you a better idea if they're going to be around for the long run. Okay, well, what about those people who picked the wrong ISP? Mm. Well, that's a different situation. If they're lucky, they'll probably be bought by a larger service provider, and after a few glitches, they'll be surfing, no problemo. But they probably will have to change their email addresses at the very least. Okay, thanks a lot, Hari. For more information about the ISP offers and what to look out for, head over to www.cnet.com. Coming up, a new way to surf the web with your TV, and how your favorite board games translate to the PC.